and welcome back to part two of the video this is the second and final part of making the final charge painting and in this part I'm pretty much just refining things and finishing things up little details I pretty much have most of the painting in place except for the foreground figures they're still kinda ambiguous right now so right now I'm trying to think of the armor design of his breastplate. I didn't want to do a normal breastplate design. I'm trying to think of different plates that can catch areas of light just so that it looks a little more interesting. I'm always trying to play with adding pools of light into my images now. Just because before they were always kind of all rendered out and didn't really have very cool lighting waiting for my image to flip sometimes it takes a while yep alright there it goes so I'm thinking these two plates over here could have some light hitting it just to add some interest in the shadows over here And I'm using the small round brush to add in those highlights right on the edge of the armor. Just pulling out those shapes a little bit. And it doesn't take much to render something out before you get a feel of what it looks like. Just a few little brush strokes here and there. And I'm staying zoomed out. I remember before someone was saying that I should add more shots of me talking while I'm taking these videos. Just so that people know that I'm human and not some kind of robot or something. But I think I'll spare you the views of watching my head talk. You'll just have to trust me that I'm not a robot and that I am a real person. I don't know, maybe I'll add some in when I'm not like sitting in my closet with my headphones on and my glasses. My setup in the closet is actually pretty ridiculous. I have my laptop sitting on top of a luggage and I have two ice packs sitting under my laptop so it doesn't get too hot because when it gets hot the fan turns on and then you can hear the fan in the background and yeah pretty awesome ah see I like hit that thing again it made my image shrink I really hate that it's so annoying but anyway going back to the painting I'm thinking about adding some more of those little metal pieces that I have on his other arm and I want to have some more of the light just hitting like part of them just to make it a little more interesting in that dark area just felt like there, there needed to be something there and it's cool because adding little jangling things like that you can almost hear it like jangling and hitting against the armor another little bit of storytelling element I guess especially for these battle scenes that are dark and gritty if you can try and you know make your image feel like you can actually hear it or you can actually smell it then that just gives your painting another dimension I'm just going in and adding some of the details to these jingling bits adding in the rings that hold them onto the armor that's another thing that I'm usually trying to figure out at all times is how does this armor actually fit together and how does it work because doing things like that will help you add a little more realism to your painting I 
I think I mainly started doing that when I was working at Mythic because people actually had to build the armor. So I had to think more of how it was actually constructed. Adding more rust on there. A little too bright. Uh, making it a little darker. Oh, I almost forgot to mention this. I don't know if you noticed, but the two guys in the foreground, before they were heading toward the rider, like they were going to attack him, but I decided not to do that and actually flipped them so that they're facing the viewer, so now they're actually part of his army instead of uh, fighting against him. Part of the reason is because it's always hard putting guys in the foreground that are facing away from you and still have it look interesting, I guess. I mean, a lot of people always want to see the faces of people. And I just think that it didn't really go together, I guess, when they were running toward them. So, yeah, that's the reason I changed it. So, let's see. I think I'm actually going to try and add the straps again on the reins I'm still not sure if I want them that bright so I'm just going in with the dark color first and then I'm gonna go back with the desaturated like orangish color and see right here I'm thinking about uh, the form of the reins and and the shape. I'm not just drawing like a line. I'm thinking of how it turns in space and it has thickness and weight to it. It's, it's kind of like um, line control in pen and ink where you don't want to have you know the same weight line all over the place throughout the entire drawing. You want thick and thin lines so you need to kind of think about that with things like this. I am back to painting his grill or his face to all you other people that aren't down with the the lingo. So I'm just going in and trying to fix up the fire effects a little bit. Yeah, and then I saw that I needed to fix something over here on the shield, so I'm fixing that. I'm always jumping around to something. Adding little nicks and squiggly marks around here. Gonna tighten these little things up a little bit. Sorry if I sound a little tired. I'm, I am getting a little tired. It's actually 3.30 a.m. when I'm filming the audio. And that's one of the things that you kind of need to prepare yourself for if you're going to be freelancing full-time. It's one of those jobs where people think that you have a lot of free time and you can just do one or two paintings a month and kick back the rest of the time and play video games or whatever but that's totally not the case unless you're like some rich famous painter which you know there are very few that can actually make that much money on a couple paintings but yeah like Brad Rigney was saying before you know there's, there's a lot of stuff that you have to give up to do this kind of job and that's really the truth of the matter I mean you need to be prepared to give up you know, a lot of your social life if you're going to be a full-time freelancer and you're going to have to put in a lot of hard hours. I mean, I typically work between 80 and 120 hours a week every week, like all the time. So it's just kind of, you know, the schedule that you're going to have to look forward to. And I'm sure not all freelance artists are like that, but a lot of them are. I mean, I usually... 
start working in the morning and then I'll work all the way until like 3 or 4 a.m. seven days a week so yeah it's uh, something to look forward to I guess if you're not willing to put in the hours and the hard work to become a better artist then you might as well choose a different profession because people think oh I'm a professional so now I don't really need to practice or push myself or anything but that's totally the wrong way of thinking because you know even though you are a professional there's still a lot of other people that are getting better and better every day so you need to keep pushing your own work just to stay on level with everyone else because otherwise you're not going to get any more jobs because everybody is going to be given to all the other artists so just always push yourself and try and improve I mean if not for yourself then you know for your career I think that's why a lot of the really awesome artists are so good is because they have this mentality that they always need to get better and that they're never happy with their own work so they always constantly push themselves to get better you know they give themselves challenges and they just always strive to do the best work that they can I mean most of the artists you talk to they say their stuff sucks and they say that they're horrible when they're not but having that kind of attitude you know it pushes yourself to do better because you're never happy with your current level of work so you're always gonna try and push for that next level and then once you get to that next level you're gonna say your stuff still sucks so you're gonna try and push for the next one and so on and so forth the key is to never be happy with your current level of work so that you always push for that next level because as soon as you become complacent with your own work you know some 18 year old kid is gonna come by and snatch up your job speaking of always striving to do your best work I hope I didn't mention this before but if I did it's actually worth mentioning again no matter what job you take you should always try to do the best that you can do at that current time because when people see your illustration they're not gonna know oh he only had like two-day deadline and he was getting crappy pay no they're just gonna see an illustration and if it sucks then they're gonna think you suck so you know screw the deadline screw the pay just try and do the best that you can do because that way you know people will see you and they'll like your work and if they do know that you're you know on a tight deadline and they see that you're still able to pull off that level of finish then they'll be even that more impressed with your work and if you're a new and upcoming freelancer and you're consistently producing quality work then that's gonna get you the higher paying jobs so you know think of it that way you know just do the best you can because it could give you that next level of jobs okay back to the painting so I added that glowy element to the shield so I'm thinking that maybe I could also add some glowy symbols to the little metal dangly bits that are hanging from his chest it's just something that might be cool and they could add the glow to the rest of or just to different parts of his armor I'm just trying to figure out what type of symbols I want to draw on there I don't want to make any you know too obvious uh, symbols or like real world symbols I guess thinking maybe I can change the shape of the horse's armor add some more spikes on it painting in that sharp highlighted edge I'm going to go ahead and add that same type of spike up there too just to mirror the, the shapes of the lower spike that's one of the things you want to try and do when you're doing character designs and illustrations you want to have repeating elements throughout your painting it'll give your painting a more cohesive feel and you can start to establish different types of themes if you do that I broke up the big area of the horse's armor on his head into three different segmented shapes 
just so that I could break up that space so it's not so boring. I'm zooming in a little bit and fixing some of the, the lines on here. Sharpening up some edges, adding some nicks and damages. And I'm going up here and color picking the rust from the shield. And if you notice, usually when I I'll, I paint something, I'll use the color picker at first. And then once I put down a color, the rest of the time I'll just color pick from the painting. And that helps me keep a cohesive feel throughout the entire painting. And I'm adding in some rivets to hold the different plates together. So those types of little details that help sell your image. Adding some rust around the rivets. Going back and talking a little bit about what types of things you have to give up in order to do this job. You're probably asking, why should I do that? Or, why did you do that? And the reason is that I've always loved art, and as a kid I always loved drawing, and I just knew that I wanted to do this as a for my career. So I just did it, and you know that's kind of what you have to do too. You know, if it's something that you really love, you just have to jump in head first and try and do it. And if you can't do it, then you know you're gonna have to try and you know get some other type of job. But I mean, you're never going to know until you actually try it. I mean, there's a lot of people that sit around saying, Oh, I could never be a freelance artist, it's too hard, and I'd never make it. Well, yeah, if you never try, then you're obviously never going to make it, so you never know. I mean, you have to try in order to accomplish anything. But I mean, you know, just do it. Stop sitting around saying that it's too hard and just decide to do it and you probably will. So right now I'm painting in the guys in the foreground and I'm thinking that maybe this guy can be carrying a shield and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is a compositional element and two is it can hide a lot of the painting so that you don't actually have to paint it. And that's one of those quick tricks and fixes that you can use as a freelance artist to make your paintings a lot faster to paint so that you don't have to paint everything. I mean, if you're on a short deadline, it's a handy little trick. But you have to be smart about it. You can't go on just like covering up your entire painting so you don't have to paint anything. You're chopping off people's hands because you don't want to spend time painting the hands. I mean, you have to do it with intent. You have to do it in terms of creating a better illustration. I keep going back and talking about the industry and you know the hard work you have to put into it and doing stuff that you should love to do. And a lot of people ask me what motivates me or inspires me. And honestly aside from the fact that I have to support my family it's because of all the other artists that are out there. I see their art and I always want to aspire to be as good as they are. So I always push myself to try and get better and better. And then I see all these really young kids coming out and just, you know, tearing up the industry. And that makes me want to push my work even harder. Because, you know, I want to stay on par with them. I want to be able to be as good as they are. I admit it's fun too to see your stuff when it actually comes out and it's in print or like when you go to the store like Borders or something and you see your stuff sitting on the shelf. You know, that's always fun and it's always a a good motivator to keep doing what you're doing. People also always ask if I get jaded or burned out and what do I do about it and how do I solve problems that I encounter and you know, working as many hours as I do, of course I'm going to get burned out at some point, or jaded at some point, and, you know, you just kind of have to work through it, because you have all these deadlines, and you have to come through, so, I mean, you just have to kind of keep, you know, chipping away, and, uh, 
you know, take a break, you know, like play a game or something, or just walk away from your illustration for a little bit and come back to it later. A lot of times you'll see something that needs to be changed, or you'll come up with an idea, and uh, it's also a lot of, you know, the way you think about things. You have to have a good attitude in order to keep pushing through everything. Like if you get a an art description that you think is really stupid and that you don't want to do it, you have to kind of think of it as, hey, someone's giving me this problem, and how can I take this problem and turn it into something that looks cool? You know, you have to think of it that way. Also, when you're taking your break, try not to think about your illustration. Because I have a really bad habit of thinking about a problem that I'm having while I'm on my break. So it's actually not a break because I'm still just sitting there thinking about how I could fix the problem or you know what the people should look like or what the composition should be. Just try and clear your mind and you know just not think about it for a while. You know sometimes you just need to take those breaks. And I also have the habit of whenever I come across a problem that I can't figure out, I'll sit there and I'll work on it constantly until I figure out how I'm going to fix it and once I finally start getting something that I like or that fixes the problem then I'll stop and take a break and then come back to it because then I'll feel better when I come back to it because the problem has been solved and then I can continue working on it and if you're really stuck then just you know ask a friend or ask someone else in the industry for their advice there are a lot of people out there that are willing to help or they'll do you know, even little paint overs for you or, you know, give you some suggestions about your composition. I mean, I've done that several times and it's really helped out. So on this guy in the foreground, I painted the rim light first in kind of the bluish grayish color, I guess. And then I added a soft light layer and I'm adding in that fire glow. And since the light is coming from the right, then I wanted to have part of the pauldron in shadow and then part coming into the light. And again, I'm playing with pools of light just to add interest to the image. So I'm adding some dangly bits on this guy too and just pulling in some of the highlights on the edge there. I wanted to make these guys look like they're all part of one army, but I also wanted to give them a little bit of character. I wanted them to be individualized instead of just all the same person. So I'm thinking about different, you know, horn growths on their head or just different ways the armor kind of fuses to their face. I also want to have this fiery glow in his horns, so I'm just painting that in. Trying to paint the lines around the form actually look at a lot of like ram horns and just animal horns and try and look at how the ridges go on those kind of things. I didn't really like that though, so I'm just gonna delete that. I usually keep a lot of things on layers too so I can just delete them really quick. Don't have to worry about it. Just like with the other guy, I want to have part of his face um, with metal and then part of his skin showing. So I'm just color picking from the other rider and painting in this guy's forehead and top of his head. And the, the part that's towards the light, I'm painting it lighter and more bluish. And the part that's in the shadow is it's more red and orange. So I'm just playing around here with different shapes for the the face armor. Not really sure how I want the tendrils to go yet. Just kind of playing around with the shapes. I'm also not sure if I want to have this guy just have one eye like the rider. He should have two eyes. Or maybe he just has you know, most of his face covered up.
that's the other problem I have is that I'm always designing as I'm painting. I never have characters drawn out beforehand. So a lot of times it takes me longer because I'm doing all my design process in the painting. And I just accidentally shrunk my painting again. So yeah, I'm painting that back out again. So you can see that I try a lot of different things when I'm going through my painting process. Color picking the highlights so I can paint these in. Kind of scribbling around a little bit, still not really sure what it should look like. But maybe if I just add enough random little highlights here and there, something will come out. So since I have the warm rim light on the other side, I'm going to have a cool light on the opposite side. Just trying to play with the warm and cools. A lot of times if you have warm lights, you'll have cool shadows in vice versa if you have cool lights you have warm shadows for some reason I usually tend to use warm shadows because cool shadows never really look right whenever I paint them I mean I can I see other people paint them and it, it looks good but whenever I try to do it just something wrong with it I don't know if it's because I'm painting them too dark like maybe if they're lighter and bluer and it would work but I don't really know. I'm not sure. So this is my like dust brush. I'm using that just to add in some dust that's been kicked up by the army that's running around. But like those kind of things you don't want to you know go too heavy handed with. You just want to do it lightly. Don't overdo it, otherwise it's going to be like crazy photoshop effect. And I'm just detailing out the armor, putting in the nicks, and the little highlights. So you can see I added a lot of that cool on the other side of his face and I'm just making it a little bit lighter. Like I've been doing that a lot, having rim lights and fill lights. It just seems to help with the form. Just describes the form a little bit better. Makes it more three dimensional. Trying to rework those horns a little bit. Trying to get the shapes to look great. Since the background on this is really light, it seems kind of weird to have the other side of the horse's head really dark. So I'm going back in and just making it a little bit lighter just so that it blends a little better with the background. Because as it was, it was kind of. It's like there was the foreground and the background, and there's a big difference between the two, and it kind of looked like it was pasted on top of it or something. So I'm just uh, trying to get that firelight in there a little bit. Just pulling out some of the edges, carving out some of the, the backside. So I'm just color picking from the background pretty much, and then just carving out the other side of the, the armor. Zooming out to check to see how it looks. And now I'm going in and adding that really strong rim light.
and just zooming out again to see how it looks and flipping the image and remember I'm just hitting command F to flip the image and I set that up through the keyboard shortcuts now I'm just looking things over a little bit trying to figure out what I should work on and I'm gonna go ahead and finish the armor on the horse's head So as I'm painting these things, I'm kind of just making up the shapes as I go along. So I'm not really sure what the design is ahead of time. Just kind of playing around with things. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So you never know. If you notice that this horn right here, or this spike, it doesn't exactly come out of the middle, so I just need to select it and move it over just so that it lines up with the other one. And I believe I did a copy merge too. After I select it, I just hit uh, Command Shift C, and then that copied it, and then I uh, did Command V or paste. And I just moved it over. And I'm going in with the this chalk brush. I use that a lot for painting metal too. Just gives it a nice texture. And I'm thinking about playing with some different shadow shapes that fall across the armor here on his head. But I don't know. It looks kind of weird. So I'm just going to delete that. I think I'll just leave it alone for now and just paint some of the guys in the foreground a little bit. I'm trying to figure out this pauldron over here. I'm not really sure what, what kind of design I want it to be. But I think I want it to have these different segments. Kind of like uh, an insect or something, maybe. And I'm also trying to play around with how much light I want to hit these pauldrons. I'm not sure if I want to make them bright like this or if I want to go back in and make them a little bit darker. I'm just pulling out those highlights along the seams of the different segments. I'm adding some more of these little dangly bits. I still haven't really zoomed in that much on this painting. I'm still staying fairly zoomed out. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can add these little rings that are holding these dangly bits together or that are attaching them to the pauldrons. If you notice, so the rest of the painting is actually really loose. Like the the highlights I put on that pauldron just a minute ago, they're just like little squiggles right now. That's one of the tough things to try and balance is you know how refined should your painting be, and how loose can you leave it. It also depends on if you're going to print with this as well, and how large it's going to be printed. I remember before when I was working on magic cards a few years ago, they used to look pretty good um, at print size, which is really small. But then they started using my things for like posters and uh, play mats and things like that. And when they blew them up, they didn't really hold together that well because they were so loose. And so when they blew them up to the larger size, you could just see so many brush strokes, and a lot of them weren't very good brush strokes so they just look kinda messy and unfinished so right here I'm adding the firelight kinda bleeding in from the other side of his pauldron 
it has a nice contrast between the the cool uh, rim light on his face and then having the the warm firelight coming in from behind. Now a lot of these I don't really have a specific light source and you know where is this firelight coming from? This It's like some crazy magical firelight that you can't see but it doesn't really matter that much as long as it looks good. I'm trying to play around with mouth shapes Now when I'm painting this glowing mouth, I want to be careful that I don't make it too bright and too glowy because I don't want to pull too much attention away from the main figure. And especially since he's in the foreground, he's, you know, people are automatically going to see him. So I don't want to make it too bright. You know, I still want the viewer's eye to go to the main figure first. And then these foreground people can be second and third reads. So just try and make sure to keep that contrast a little bit lower and have the largest contrast in your focal point. So I'm just going in with the soft light and trying to add that. And now I actually completely changed the background color. I wanted to try a darker color just to see how it looked. And I'm going in and adding a selective color uh, adjustment layer and I'm choosing the blacks or actually now I'm on the neutrals and you can just see some of the settings I used flipping it back and forth I felt like my darks were too dark and too dead so I'm just trying to add a little bit of color into it and this is the levels adjustment layer and then right here I did a multiply so I'm just showing you I wanted to make it everything darker. And this right here is the uh, overlay layer. So now I'm on a normal layer and I'm just using this texture brush trying to add in some sky color. Just trying to make it a little bit lighter. I felt like the darker background and just the darker color overall fit the mood a little bit better. And it also pumped up the contrast between the the guys and the flaming arm and just the glowy bits everywhere. I think the other background was a little too light. You'll notice here that you can see like a big round brush mark. So I'm just going in and trying to erase out that mark just so it doesn't look so photoshoppy. Now I'm trying to paint in some like birds, I guess. There's some kind of flying creature. A lot of times I use bird brushes, but a lot of times they can just look too repetitive and people automatically know oh that's the bird brush so I try to paint them in by hand as often as possible but sometimes I get lazy now at print size you probably won't even really notice those but they're kind of fun to add in there anyway and I'm just trying to fix some of my shapes what happens when you work zoomed out um, once you zoom in you can see that your shapes don't really connect properly and so you have to go in and just refine things that's just part of the refining process that's why a lot of times when you zoom out everything looks good but then you zoom in you're like oh crap like none of my stuff looks good it doesn't line up and it looks really loose Now I'm just trying to play around with the glow of his sword. It it looks too 
white and blasted out, so I'm just trying different things, trying to get back to something more fiery, I guess. I'm gonna go do that, uh, the fire layer effects thing that I did earlier. So I'm painting in with white and letting the gradient map do all the work. I'm painting on top of the hair right now because it doesn't matter because I can just go back in and erase it out. It's too hard trying to paint around it so I'll just paint on top and go back. The tough thing was with fire is just getting the dynamics correct and making sure it doesn't look too repetitive or too fake or photoshoppy. So for the center part I want it to be a little harder shaped or harder edged so I'm using the round brush. And just adding some speckles here and there like some embers or sparks I guess. And this is like my dust brush that I use for painting dust and things. I also use it on faces for painting stubble, like facial hair. And so here I'm just going in with the eraser and erasing that stuff out. Or you can just add a layer mask and when you paint in black, make sure you have it selected. So that it actually keeps the layer, it just hides it. That way if you don't like the changes, you can just go back in and erase out the mask. Now the other way you can add a layer mask is just select your layer and then blow it on, you know, where those, all those little icons are. There's one that's like a, a dark rectangle with the white circle in the middle. You can just click that and it'll add a layer mask. I'm leaving some of the firelight hitting the hair, so that's fine. I'm wondering if I should show the back edge of this mountain a little bit, or if it should just go off into smoke and dust. So this is what it looked like before and after. I'm just painting some of these parts out just so it doesn't look so repetitive. And I'm painting on the layer mask. So they're actually still there, they're just being masked out. And on the same fire layer, I'm going in and adding some of the firelight hitting the top of the horse's armor. Now I'm trying to figure out the character design for this other guy in the foreground. Thinking that maybe the lower part is all masked out, or he has a mask on, and then some kind of... Uh, metal growth like the other guys but I'm thinking he won't have a mouth so I'm just trying to find the planes of his forehead right now so I have that leftmost plane which is lighter than the middle plane and then the right plane which is a little darker than the middle one and I like to sketch in these big flat shapes for the planes at first and then you refine from that.
I'm zooming in a little bit so I can get the shape of his eye correct. Adding some of it hitting his eyelids. And I think this guy will have two glowing eyes, unlike the other two guys. Or maybe not. <laughs> So now I'm painting in some of the the light hitting his brow or his uh, cheekbone right here. Now I'm just color picking from the main guy. You'll notice that on top of his head I add, I'm adding some of that firelight again and that uh, sword behind him is catching some of it as well. If you look at Norman Rockwell's paintings, you'll notice that his characters are all doing something different and they're all looking in different directions or doing different movements. So I was trying to keep that in mind with these guys. Each one of these guys is looking in a different direction and they're doing something different. So this guy in the foreground, I thought that maybe he could be looking up almost at the camera. Just so that it's a little bit different than the other guys get some variety in your painting. That'll help to just sell your image because you know people do different things and they look different directions and you don't want you don't want it to look too staged, I guess. So even in a fantasy painting like this, you can use some of the things that you've learned from the old masters. You know, they don't have to be fantasy painters to apply to what you're doing. Actually, now that I look at it, that sword behind him, that huge one, is kind of out of place. I kind of wish that I hadn't have put that there. I guess it made more sense when they're charging towards him, but now that they're coming toward the camera, it's, you know, it's kind of weird. It seems really big, too. So right there, I was thinking about doing some kind of a collar on him. I don't know. So now I skipped ahead a little bit and I, I had added a bunch of dust in between the foreground guys and the, the main character. But I think I in the end I ended up taking it out because it just looked to be too much. I'm sitting here for a really long time trying to figure out if I want to keep it or not. So that's what it looked like before and after. A lot of times I'll do this, I'll just sit and turn a layer on and off and on and off. And I'll just sit there flipping it back and forth trying to figure out which is the better one. And a lot of times in the end I end up doing one, a version in between. So I'm thinking maybe the dust layer I could just lower the opacity or something. Uh, I don't know, I'm still flipping back and forth. So I decide for now just to keep it and just keep working on my painting. I can always go back later and change the opacity on it or just turn it off. That's one of the good things about putting things on different layers. So I added a lot more of the firelight hitting the the guy on the lower left head. Again with the other guy, I want to make sure that the contrast on his head isn't the highest contrast in the painting because I don't want your eye to go there first. I think I've pretty much answered most of the questions that people had. I, I remember someone was asking about um, just drawing and they noticed that I used the liquify tool a lot on my previous tutorial and they're asking you know why don't I just draw it correctly the first time instead of having to use a liquify tool so much and it's just because I I can't 
draw something correct the first time. I, I think a lot of people aren't able to draw something correct the very first time they do it. I mean, I wish I had that skill that I could do that, but I just can't, so that's the reason. And also, as I'm painting, you know, I'm thinking of different things, I'm changing my ideas, I'm, you know, changing composition and changing character design, so it's hard to just, you know, do something once the first time and never change it again. But bringing that up, he's actually right. I need to go back and just practice my drawing skills more just so that I don't have to spend so much time trying to fix my own drawing. I mean, I feel like that lately I've kind of slipped in my drawing ability. So I think I need to go back and do some more figure drawing classes or something. I'm back to the idea of painting a collar on this guy. I just thought that it might be cool having like some kind of a collar on him since everyone else is just decked out in metal. Thought it might be a cool contrast. A good juxtaposition of metal and cloth. One thing to keep in mind when doing character designs is the different materials. Try to have you know, different materials in your character just to add interest. So. And these guys I have metal and leather and this guy kinda has cloth I guess not too much so I was talking about using the speckle brush earlier for hair so that's what I'm gonna do in this guy I was thinking that he might have some hair in the middle of his head kinda like a mohawk but just like you know spiky strands These guys are a little post-apocalyptic, I guess, kind of, but more fantasy sci-fi-ish, I don't know. So he's like the punk warrior guy. you can see up close it's still super loose I mean even the the main guy is still really loose going in now with that desaturated orange adding in those veins and they end up looking blue due to the colors around it Putting some more in the shadows over here. I think that's one of the things that I like to paint the most is, you know, adding the veins on people. I haven't really painted, like, the things between the guys, I guess, or like the rest of the horse, or like the legs of the guys behind them, and you don't really need to paint those really because it's not the focus and if you paint too many things it's just gonna get all jumbled together and it's gonna be chaotic and your eyes not gonna have any place to rest and the guys won't pop as well so leaving that stuff out actually should help the illustration hopefully because if you had like all that stuff in between those guys like below the horse's head but in between the two people I think it would just have too much information there plus it saves you a lot of time from having to figure it all out and paint it in so here I wanted to add a bolt on the guy's mask and I'm picking some of the blue from the other guy and adding it in and some rust just wanted to have it like bolted to his face using a desaturated blue
zooming in so I can get this bolt correct, but still leaving things pretty loose. I'm going to sharpen this edge up a little bit, punch some of the highlights. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm still just leaving it really sketchy, especially like the shadow side of his face. I mean, it's barely even painted in. So I'm still, I gotta figure out this pauldron. I'm thinking I want some spikes, but I want to have more curved spikes. So he's a little bit different than the other guy. I want to have some going in front of um, the guy on the left. Just to push the depth between them. But uh, of course as soon as I say that I go and delete it all. Usually when I paint, I kind of block things in in a dark color, and then I gradually paint in the light. So that's what I'm doing with this. I'm just slowly going into the lighter colors. Looking for a dark color to pick. I can pull out the shapes of the pauldron I think I'm using that chalk type brush just to throw down some textures pulling out the highlights for the edge a lot of times too when you're painting like these dark gritty warriors it helps to to use hard gritty brushes and just leave things kind of loose because when you paint the armor that way it makes it look all beat up and banged up and just dirty there's definitely such a thing as over rendering something so I'm just trying to leave it a little bit loose but not too loose I mean as long as it looks okay from fairly close up, you know, then I should be good. Just making these spikes a little bit thicker, they look a little thin. Pulling out the edge highlight. I'm actually getting really close to finishing this illustration up. I mean, there's just a few little things that I need to, to refine a little bit more, but it's pretty much finished. I have most of the elements in there and refined to the point that I need to get them to. And that's the tricky thing, trying to decide when you're finished and when you're not. So yeah, now at this point I'm still going back and trying to figure out if I want that dust layer but I, I ended up pulling most of it out I think I just ended up lowering the opacity a lot or I erased most of it out I can't remember so one thing that I noticed or actually that my wife pointed out the way I, I rendered this horn if you your eye will follow the directions of those squigglies and this is the eye flow that you kind of get so it kind of keeps your eye down at the bottom of the image instead of going up to the main guy's face so it's actually the wrong direction for that so what I did is I just selected the horn and then I flipped it so now you can see the angle is going this way which brings you up to his shield which brings you over to his face down to his arm, down that sword, to the guy on the left, and then to the guy on the right. So this makes the eye flow into a much larger circle that hits 
all the main points in my image. So just small things like that, just try and be aware of. I mean, it may seem insignificant, but it actually makes a difference. So now I just need to go in and rework the directions of the ridges in this horn. It may seem like a pain in the butt to have to go in when you're when you think you're almost finished and have to change something. And I mean, I guess it kind of is, but at the same time it's not and it's an important enough change that you need to go ahead and make it, you know, don't be lazy, especially when you know you need to change something. Just go ahead and change it because in the end you're going to have a better illustration because of it. And don't be afraid to go back and make changes. So now you can see the difference between the two. And I actually think it helps a lot. It's one of those things that you don't really notice, but for some reason your eye does do that. And sometimes it just takes someone else looking at your image to be able to figure out why your eye flow is doing that. I mean, you know, you're looking at your image for long periods of time, so you kind of don't really notice things like that. And I'm saving this as a different iteration. I always do that when I'm working on images, just in case I need to go back to a previous iteration, or if one of my files gets corrupted, or Photoshop crashes and I forgot to save, you know, I always have backups. And I am pretty much finished, so I'm going to go ahead and sign this at the bottom. Whenever I sign my images, I always try and make it really subtle. So I, I go ahead and lower the opacity quite a bit on this so you can't see it very well. I mean, I don't want my signature to draw all the attention away from the image. And I usually play around with the size and where I place it. I try to make it as uh, inconspicuous as possible. And of course after I signed it I saw some other stuff that I wanted to change. Some, or not really change but just render out some more. So I'm just adding this shadow down here just so I can describe the form better. Make it look a little more rounded. Usually when you think you're done, you're not really done. You have like 5 or 10% more to go. So it's good to take a break from your image and then go back to it. And then usually things will jump out at you that you need to fix or change or add. Punching some of these highlights in the middle. Again, just so that the form reads better. Actually looking back at it, that spike probably needs to get moved over to the left a little bit. I'm looking things over once more just to see if there's anything else that jumps out at me that I want to fix or change. And it seems pretty much finished, so I'm just going to flatten it and then I'm going to duplicate it by dragging it to the little page. And I'm going to go and I'm going to Gaussian blur everything. I'm going to take that down to about four pixels. You can see it in the little preview window there. And I'm going to go in and erase out the parts that I want to be sharper. So it's kind of a like a camera trick or a movie trick where the Things in the foreground are in focus and the background is out of focus. 
I think it's called rack focus or something like that. Well, technically it refers to when you switch from focusing on the background to the foreground or vice versa, but you get the idea. And doing this can be pretty tricky because you have to find that fine line of um, making it look not too blurry. So I'm just going in and erasing parts out. I don't want it to hit you over the head that you know everything is blurry except for the main guy. I just want it to shift a little bit of your attention more to the people in the foreground. It also helps the depth of the image too, I think. If things in the background are a little bit blurrier and the things in the foreground are a little bit sharper, you don't want to have the same edges around your entire painting because it's going to flatten things out. But don't get me wrong, you don't have to blur things in order to achieve uh, depth. I mean, you can just do it by values. Values and also the amount of detail that you put into something. The things in the background can just be really loose. And things in the foreground could be more detailed and that would achieve the same thing. So when you flip it on and off, you can kind of see the difference, but it's pretty subtle, which is what I wanted. I didn't want it to be too crazy. Zooming in and flipping it back and forth again. Erasing parts out. Checking it again. So I noticed on his head there's this weird like shadow, but it's in the shape of like the round brush. So I just want to go in and change the shape of that a little bit to follow the form of his head because it didn't really match anything. I'm just trying to erase the tracks of the digital mark. Going in with the chalk type brush. And it helps to squint your eyes too when you're painting just to so you can see the values a little more easily. I'm sharpening some of these edges up because they look pretty blurry. I'm wondering if maybe these little flying guys should have some highlights. Maybe just a little bit. I don't know. Probably take it out. I think it was drawing too much attention. Just sharpening up the spikes on his head. Some of it looks a little too blurry. Like these spikes are a little too blurry, especially since they're in the foreground like that. I think after I finished filming this, I went and looked at it again and I felt like the blur was a little too much and too noticeable so I think I ended up taking most of it out or it's lowered the opacity of the blur level a little bit I'm just uh, adding a couple little nicks and pieces of rust and things like that around the image but other than that it's finished so I hope you enjoyed watching this painting and I hope you got a little out of it in terms of you know what I think about when I'm composing an illustration and some of the things I think about and you know just how I compose an image with multiple figures and now you know how to do some quick and fancy fire techniques and uh, how to do the blur technique just don't overdo any of these techniques too much because it'll end up shouting hey this is Photoshop and 
You don't want to rely on these, you know, cheesy effects too much. Uh, I hope you had a lot of fun. Thanks a lot. Hey, this is Darkin. So as you can see, I really am filming in a closet. And this is actually going to be the last time I'll be filming in this closet because I'm moving to California in like a week. So say goodbye to the closet. Bye-bye.